Finally tonight, how the Supreme Court could reshape the political year. Tackling separate controversial cases, the court will rule on the limits of government power in three branches of government, judicial, legislative, and executive. Just yesterday, the justices agreed to take up a tough immigration law from Arizona that would, among other things, punish illegal immigrants who apply for or work in Arizona and require law enforcement to detain anyone suspected of being in the state unlawfully. The court has also agreed to consider whether federal judges acted properly when they redrafted legislative and congressional district lines in Texas. And in what could turn out to be the year's most consequential case, the court will decide whether a new federal law that requires individuals to possess health care coverage is constitutional. The high court is expected to hand down all three decisions by the summer. Joining us to assess the court's big year are NewsHour regular Marsha Coyle of the National Law Journal and Jeff Schessel, author of the book Supreme Power, Franklin Roosevelt versus the Supreme Court. Marsha, starting with you, how are these cases alike and how are they different? Well, uh, they're different because they involve either different laws or different provisions within the Constitution. They're alike because they all have to do, if you step back from them, with the proper role of the different branches of government as well as the, the relationship between the federal government and state governments. If you boil it down simply, it ha they all have to do with power. Who should exercise it properly under the Constitution? In your experience covering the court, how unusual is it for all three branches of government to come get Supreme Court review like this? Well, I don't think it's unusual at all. I, but I think what's unusual about these three cases is the potential political ramifications they may have for the upcoming election, uh, as well as issues that people really care about and could have an impact on individuals' lives. Jeff Chesel, let's talk about that. How uh, big a political impact does the almost accidental collision of these three cases have on this court? And how unusual is that? Well, I think each one of these cases has an impact politically. If you take each one of these issues, they all have a tendency to be explosive, particularly in an election year. And when you line them up like this and you get by June a series of decisions that may add up to one big message from the Supreme Court, there's the potential to really amplify the debate that we're already having in this budding election year about the proper role of government. It's a, it's a debate we always have in American life, but there are periods of time when that debate really flares up. And I think in the years since the economic crisis, since 2008, we've been in a kind of rolling argument about this, and it's certainly set to be ratcheted up a few notches in the election year. Is there any way to compare this to past election years where the court has had its impact? Absolutely. I think the, the Supreme Court is often an election issue. The balance of power on the court is almost always at stake in a presidential election. A new president or a continuing president usually has the chance to appoint somebody. So there's that. But I think you really do have to go all the way back to 1936 when Franklin Roosevelt was facing his first reelection fight to find a Supreme Court docket in an election year that was as packed with political dynamite as this one. Marsha, in order for something to get to the court, as we talk about on this program all the time, there has to be some disagreement in lower courts. In the case of the redistricting case in Texas, how did it, how did it end up coming to the court? Well, the redistricting case is very complicated procedurally because uh, it's playing out right now in three different courts. Uh, it came to the Supreme Court because the state of Texas uh, challenged a federal court in San Antonio, Texas, which had drafted what is known as an interim redistricting plan. The Texas legislature drafted a redistricting plan after the 2010 census. Texas is what is known as a covered state under the Voting Rights Act because it had passed discrimination against voters. As a covered state, its redistricting plans have to be approved either by the Department of Justice or a federal district court in Washington. It has not yet gotten clearance. The Department of Justice has raised questions about some of the, the, the districts that have been drafted. A whole raft of organizations, civil rights groups, have challenged the redistricting plan in a federal court in San Antonio, Texas. Because this has dragged on and Texas has not gotten preclearance or a final decision, the court in San Antonio felt it needed to draft an interim plan because the primary was coming up, filing deadlines were coming up. 
Texas said that court did not apply the proper standard in drafting its plan and appealed to the Supreme Court. And the Arizona case, this is something in which the government, the governor of Arizona wants the Supreme Court to provide some kind of clarity. Absolutely. There's a lot of energy in the Republican Party right now to bring problems, uh, as, as we define them, back to the states and to empower the states to handle these problems. There's a strong belief on the right that that's what the Constitution says and th that the federal government has been overreaching. Um, and so you have a, a great desire not only on the part of Arizona but on a part of a number of states to take over essentially immigration enforcement, enforcement against illegal Im immigration. And so yes, Arizona wants clarity, but they want clarity in a particular direction. There's a very clear outcome they're, they're uh, aiming at. Here. And a lot of states want, cl want clarity on the health care mandate as well. How is it that all these kinds of challenges end up at the court at once. Some, <laughs> anybody watching this would think innocently that there is a design behind this, but that's not the way it works. Is no, it? it really isn't. The, the, the cases come to the court uh, based on how quickly the lower courts act, uh, how quickly a lawsuit is filed, and then the lower courts act. Uh, everyone knew, in a sense, that these three issues would be challenged, the law as well as the redistricting plans and immigration. Uh, but it's purely coincidence. Uh, the court has discretion on what it takes. With the health care law, it was a no-brainer that they were going to take it because a lower federal appellate court struck down an act of Congress, the Solicitor, of Gen Solicitor General of the United States, who's obligated to defend acts of Congress, went to the Supreme Court. It's classic for the court to take a case like that. Uh, with Arizona, it had, it had some discretion. The, the Obama administration said, wait, there are lots of these challenges pending in the lower courts. Wait until several federal appellate courts have dealt with it. And, and then you, you can look at the arguments and consider it. But the court decided to take it. And Texas, it was a little bit ahead of the game because the, the lower federal courts had not yet ruled on the uh, redistricting plan. However, the primaries coming up, the d filing deadlines right. are there, so obviously the court felt it had to move. And there's an affirmative action case per percolating out there. Somewhere there is, in as fact, well. it's right on. It's the court has conferenced on it, and we're waiting to see if it's going to take it. It involves the University of Texas. Jeff, how fair is it for uh, non-legal observers to look at this and think that it's perfectly natural for the court to be in, to involve itself in political matters? Well, these are political matters, but they're also constitutional matters. And I don't think anyone's arguing that there are not legitimate and big constitutional questions at stake in these cases. I think that there are always uh, folks who imagine that the court wants to stay out of these matters, doesn't want to become an issue in a, in a campaign year, doesn't want to become an issue ever. And certainly that's true. The court is not eager to become an issue. But I think what these three cases remind us is that this court and particularly as constituted by its present members, is not at all shy about stepping right into some of the biggest debates we're having in this country. Jeff Schessel, author of Supreme Power, Franklin Roosevelt versus the Supreme Court, and Marsha Coyle, our regular news, our regular National Law Journal. Thank you both very much. Pleasure.